Hello and welcome to the first episode of China Edge brought to you by the SubChina team. I'm your host, Lizzie. Here at China Edge, we go beyond the headlines and guide you, our audience, through the jungle of the Chinese regulations. We go deep into industry trends and identify opportunities in the Chinese market as well as its challenges. Join our conversation every week for interviews and analysis with the most knowledgeable minds on China. Also, stay tuned for special panel sessions with Kaiser Kuo, host of the Seneca podcast, and Jeremy Goldkorn, editor-in-chief of SubChina. Our guest Guest today is Mr. Andy Rothman, an investment strategist at Matthews Asia. Andy will help us understand the macroeconomic outlook of China in 2022. Andy, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Lizzie. Good to be with you. So, Andy, as we saw in the news, China is starting to reimpose COVID restrictions just days after easing of lockdowns in key cities like Beijing and in Shanghai. Is China going to be stuck in a cycle of outbreaks and, and lockdowns? What's the end game for zero COVID policy and what implications does it have on China's economy? Well, COVID is a great place to start talking about the Chinese economy because that really is the most important factor in thinking about where the economy is going to be going over the coming quarters. Um, I would say that they're not reimposing lockdowns, and they're, but they've never really moved away from what they refer to as a zero tolerance policy okay. for COVID. Unfortunately, the government also hasn't been really clear to its own citizens or to foreigners about how they're going to manage Omicron in the coming months and quarters. And that raises the level of uncertainty about where the economy is going to go. I think odds are very low that we will see widespread citywide lockdowns like we saw for more than two months in Shanghai. But I do think that it's likely that at least for the next several months, we're going to see periodic small-scale lockdowns across individual housing compounds or even neighborhoods in cities because, as we've seen in the rest of the world, including in Asia, Omicron's not going away. So this uncertainty is going to be an element, but I think what we're starting to see are the early stages of an economic recovery as the major lockdowns are being pared back. Right. And speaking of economic recovery, what macro policy initiatives do you expect to see in the remaining of Q2 this year through Q4? Do you think rate cuts are on the table? I think almost everything is on the table. Uh, we've already seen some targeted rate cuts. We've already seen uh, the central bank increasing the availability of credit, which for me is even more important than the rates themselves. Uh, and it's also important to remember that when we look at China and compare it to the U.S. and most of the rest of the world, Chinese monetary and fiscal policy is going to be moving in the opposite direction. Right. We're going to continue to be tightening. China is going to continue to be loosening. So on a relative basis, the Chinese economy is going to be stronger than most of the rest of the world. But we have to go back to COVID because the Chinese government can ease monetary and fiscal policy. They can ease regulatory policy, which I also think is coming. But the uncertainty over how COVID is going to be applied is going to remain. For example, one of the things that I'm really worried about is the conflicting message that local officials across China are receiving. Right. On the one hand, they're being told that they need to try and prevent any resurgence in COVID cases, which is really difficult or impossible with Omicron, given how transmissible it is. And on the other hand, they're also being told that they should get the economy back going again. So that puts pressure on them. And I think what we're going to see are problems like local officials deciding to block logistics change because they're going to be worried about allowing trucks to come into their city, uh, which where the drivers might be infected with COVID but not be symptomatic yet. So I think these are the kinds of obstacles to a serious economic rebound that we're going to have to watch carefully in the coming months. Right. And speaking of that conflicting message between zero COVID and economic recovery, as we read in the international media, there seems to be some tension between the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and the Chinese President Xi Jinping. Do you think that's going to be a significant sort of political um, insight, for lack of a better word, or are we reading too much into those lines? I think some people might be reading too much into that. Uh, I think we need to remember that Li Keqiang, uh, the premier, his portfolio is economics. So it's not surprising or unusual that he's out talking about economic policy. We also have to remember that everything he's saying and doing is coming within the structures of the Chinese Communist Party, which is clearly controlled by his boss, Xi Jinping. So I don't see this as a struggle between the two of them or between different factions in the party. I think he's doing his job, and I think he's doing his job with the blessing 
of Xi Jinping, who is saying my number one priority is controlling Omicron, but we don't need we don't want to forget about trying to get people's lives back to normal and get the economy going again. Right. And and I want to turn to China's property market a little bit. We just been under severe pressure for the last two years. Do you expect Beijing to relent on bringing in its housing market this year, given the headwinds in the economy? I think they've already set the stage for doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's important to start by recognizing why the property market was really weak starting in the second half of last year and running through now. It wasn't because of structural problems in the property market or weak demand for new homes. It was because of a policy decision the government made back in May. So in the first five months of last year, new home sales were really strong. Prices were up. Property sales on a square meter basis increased by almost 40 percent year over year in the first five months. Then in May, the government basically shut down the market by telling banks to stop issuing mortgages. And in the rest of the year, the last seven months of the year, new home sales were down about 13 percent year over year. But this was all because of a policy choice. They were trying to prevent prices from rising too far. They were really focused on trying to promote consolidation in the industry by pushing a few of the riskiest developers out of business, but they overdid it. Mm -hmm. And by the end of last year, the government acknowledged that they'd overdid it, overdone it, and they started relaxing those policies. So what we saw in recent months is that mortgages are flowing again. Mortgage interest rates have been cut. And the central government has allowed for the first time in a long time, many cities to put together their own incentive packages to lower the barriers to buying a new home while still making sure that buyers have enough cash because the minimum cash down payment in China is still 20% of the purchase price. So I think that the stage has been set for a recovery in the property market, but that recovery can't really get going until Omicron restrictions are underway because if you're locked down in your apartment or you're afraid of being locked down next week, you're not going to go out and buy a new home. Um, given the dismal data we saw in Q1, April, as well as May, is the 5.5% of GDP target still reasonable? How important do you think it will be for Xi Jinping's administration to reach that stated goal? Uh, my view is that 5.5% GDP growth target is both unattainable and unimportant. Uh, I don't think anybody inside of China is really focused on that at all. We have to remember that these targets are set as a motivational guideline for local officials across the country. But obviously, the lockdowns and other measures to deal with COVID have intervened there. But I don't think this is a priority. Uh, what we've seen from the party leadership is the number one priority is to continue to prevent Omicron from causing a public health crisis in China. And they've been really successful at that. We do have to acknowledge that the death rate for COVID on a population basis in China has been extraordinarily low. And clearly in recent months, they've said that they're willing to sacrifice economic growth in favor of maintaining that control over the impact of Omicron. So I don't think anybody in the Chinese government is really focused on or concerned about whether they hit 5.5%. I think instead what they're trying to do is make sure Omicron doesn't get out of control in terms of the death rate, uh, because we've seen uh, an increase in death rates in places like Taiwan and South Korea. And here in the U.S., the death rate's still running, I think, at about 300 or so uh, people per day. And what I think they are hoping for is that by the time of the 20th Party Congress in probably in November, there'll be signs of an economic rebound. But I don't think anybody's focused on 5.5. Are they going to formally change the number? Probably not. But I would advise people just not to focus on that very much. It's not that important. So Xi Jinping's signature economic campaign, the Common Prosperity Initiative, seems to have faded from the headlines in recent months. In the mid to long term, will Xi Jinping return to this Common Prosperity Agenda? Are we going to see further regulatory pressure on the private sector? Are we going to see more debt cleanup of the property markets? What's your mid to long term projection here? I think common prosperity is still one of the most important things for Xi Jinping and is still going to be a focal point for his third five-year term, which is going to kick off at the end of this year. But let's put common prosperity into context first. Uh, I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding, uh, both inside China and outside China, especially about what common prosperity means. Let's remember that this phrase has been around for a long time. Mao used it in the 1950s. Xi Jinping started talking about it 10 years ago when he became head of the party. 
And I think the objectives of common prosperity are admirable. And I think they're consistent with the socio-political concerns that we have in the United States and most other countries around the world. It represents a concern about inequality of income, inequality of wealth, unequal access to healthcare and education. And on the corporate side, concerns that some large firms, particularly in the online space, are using their size to use anti-competitive practices to keep challengers down. And I think that the problem has been in China, especially last year, that while these goals were admirable, the way they went about trying to achieve them was chaotic and poorly communicated. And so that left a lot of uncertainty for businesses in China, especially for foreign investors. But I think that too, like the housing policy that I was talking about before, has been evolving. The government also announced that at the end of last year and early this year, that they acknowledged that they'd overdone implementation of common prosperity. And I think that the greatest volatility in the regulatory environment in China has passed. They're not giving up those objectives about reducing inequality, but I think we're going to see a much less chaotic and volatile enforcement of the common prosperity regulations in the coming quarters and, and years. And now companies understand what this means. They can factor it into their business models. And as investors, we also better understand how this is going to play out so we can better understand what a reasonable valuation for a Chinese company is, given that we know that workers are going to have to take home more money, that, uh, that uh, availability of benefits for healthcare and education is going to have to increase. So I think it's going to be much less volatile. But again, this won't really play out until after the COVID uncertainty ends. So given the COVID uncertainties and given your understanding of China's regulatory environment this year overall, do you think investors should remain bullish on China? So my advice to investors from my seat on our investment team where I'm the macro person rather than a stock strategist is, is to focus on a few things. One is we have to remember how important China is to the global economy. And so I think for American investors, European investors, the most important thing is to understand what's happening in China. Because even if you don't own shares in Chinese companies, what happens in China has and will continue to have an enormous impact on our economy and our companies. China, every year on average, accounts for about one third of global economic growth. That's a larger share of global growth than from the US, Europe, and Japan combined. So the first thing that tells us is we really need to understand in some depth what's happening in the Chinese economy rather than be kind of whipsawed by the daily headlines about what's happening there. Second is we have to recognize that what happens in China is really important for a lot of companies that as investors, we might own shares in for our retirement. For example, many people don't realize that GM sells more cars in China every year than it does in the United States, that tech companies like Qualcomm get two thirds of their global revenue from China, which is really important to making sure they have enough money to continue to invest in R&D. We have to acknowledge that while China hasn't lived up to all of its WTO uh, commitments, they've lived up to enough of them that since they joined the WTO about two decades ago, US exports to China are, are up about 600% compared to about 160% for the rest of the world. US agricultural exports are up 1,600% uh, compared to about 600% to the rest of the world. So it actually has worked really well. They're now our number one market for agricultural exports. So that part of it's important from a, a generic perspective to keep focused on what's going on in China. But I would also say that given that China drives global growth and there's a lot of really interesting innovative companies there, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. Right now, there's a lot of uncertainty, particularly about COVID. At the same time, as we talked about before, China's monetary, fiscal, and regulatory policy is moving on an easing path, while here in the US, we're moving towards monetary and fiscal tightening. And valuations in China are really low right now. So I would argue that this is a great time for investors to do a little bit more research on China, a little bit more due diligence on uh, investing in China. And so to be prepared that when the time comes where the uncertainty over how China is going to manage Omicron has dissipated, they'll be ready to make decisions about how to add China exposure to their portfolio. 